Hello everybody, I'm Ajit K. Mishra, your course instructor for literature and coping skill. I'm here yet again with the last lecture of this module on negotiating trauma. In the last three lectures, I walked you through the idea of trauma, its various aspects, its impacts and various coping strategies that we can employ in order to take care of our traumatic experiences or negotiate uh, trauma in a manner so that we can uh, return to normal life and we can ensure our well-being. So today I am going to walk you through the idea of a very different kind of trauma with the help of uh, a poetic composition by Elizabeth Murphy, The Night That Changed Everything. As I walk you through this poetic composition, I'll also be talking about the various coping skills and strategies that the speaker in this particular poetic composition uses. But before I take you there, I'll be walking you through the idea of this different kind of trauma that we call sexual violence. Because this is a poetic composition which is based on the idea of sexual violence and its implications for the psychological well-being of a person or the victim. So uh, let's take a look at each of these things. This kind of sexual violence is called intimate partner violence or IPV. Intimate partner violence is one of the most raging issues associated with trauma or PTSD. So many uh, surveys and uh, researchers have established the fact that IPV is one of the major perpetrators of PTSD. It leads to sexual violence which in fact severely dents the psychological and the physiological makeup of the trauma of victim. Therefore, it's, it's very, very important for everyone to be aware of intimate partner violence and to know how to talk about intimate partner violence so that the impact or the effect of this particular devastating experience can be minimized or can be rid of. So therefore, it's important that uh, uh, we also take uh, a look at intimate partner violence. According to the World Health Organization, intimate partner violence is one of the most common forms of violence against women. So that's very, very uh, important because this is one type of violence which has a very specific victim category, that is, that is a woman. So, it's very a uh, common form of violence against women. And this type of violence includes both physical, sexual, emotional abuse and controlling behaviors by an intimate partner. The intimate partner can be a husband, can be a friend, can be a living partner, can be anybody. But it's the intimate partner, the male partner especially, who is the perpetrator of this kind of violence. And as a result of this violence, the psychological and the physiological setup or makeup of a female person gets severely dented. So sometimes this kind of violence is also called battery. We'll take another look at uh, a definition given to us by CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Intimate partner violence describes physical violence, sexual violence, stalking or psychological harm by a current or former partner or spouse. So when we take a close look at these two definitions, we'll understand that this type of violence is very closely associated with sexual violence as well. 
apart from the physical violence which leads to physical injury and physical harm there is this particular element which looms large over this particular type of experience which we call intimate partner violence so for our purpose of understanding the sexual violence I'll be focusing on the various aspects of sexual violence and its implications for the well-being or the altered well-being status of the victim. So let's take a look at sexual violence. Sexual violence also includes some kind of psychological uh, violence as well uh, because uh, sexual violence which begins as uh, a form of physical violence in fact results in psychological devastations for the victim therefore uh, it's a very complex uh, uh, kind of violence sexual abuse sexual assault or sexual violence sexual violence is uh, shockingly common across societies that's, that's uh, something which uh, requires our immediate attention towards it uh, because uh, we can with uh, the little contributions that we can make, uh, we can actually bring about certain positive changes uh, to this particular condition. So sexual violence is uh, a shockingly uh, common phenomenon across all societies. Uh, the Disease uh, Control Center, that CDC in the United States, uh, has also reported that one in five women in the United States are raped or sexually assaulted at some point in their lives. That's a huge figure. And we also have similar data for our countries as well. So that's uh, uh, in fact a very, very uh, disturbing uh, data, disturbing uh, piece of information. And when we come to uh, Asian, African or Middle Eastern countries, that figure is even higher. That's even disturbing. And all this happens because of an intimate partner, a person whom these victims trust or, or know closely. So that's the problem. And that's one big reason why um, it's very, very difficult for us to um, you know, contain this particular menace. So it's important that we um, you know, wake up to this particular challenge timely. Regardless of uh, age or gender, the impact of sexual violence goes far beyond any physical injuries. I, I told you that. The trauma of being raped or sexually assaulted can be shattering, leaving a person feeling scared, ashamed, and alone or plagued by nightmares, flashbacks, and other unpleasant memories. The world doesn't feel like a safe place anymore to the victim. And uh, the victim no longer trusts other because that element is lost. And sometimes the victim doesn't even trust oneself. So, the victim may begin to question one's judgment, self-worth, and even the sanity, the mental stability. And then the person may begin to blame oneself or what happened. And the person may also begin to uh, feel that one is dirty or damaged. And this will affect relationships severely. 
and intimacy will be dented. And on top of that, like many rape survivors, people may struggle with PTSD, anxiety and depression. Now, these are some of those uh, most disturbing issues associated with the idea of sexual violence. So, sexual violence, if we have to understand the idea, is related to rape, all kinds of rape, including date rape, which is a very complex uh, form of rape uh, uh, because of uh, on the, the excuses thrown by the perpetrators. And then molestation, which is a very, very um, pervasive phenomenon in our societies. Incest, again, is very, very pervasive, non-consensual sexual contact, that is without the consent or without the permission of the other partner, if advances are made. So it can be instances of fondling, it can be instances of groping, touching, bad touch, I mean. Um, it can be you know, instances of uh, uh, you know, coming closer, making advances, uh, and then non-contact sexual abuse can be uh, you know, examples of uh, revenge uh, pornographic sites, uh, can be uh, texting uh, sexually objectionably, uh, objectionable content, and a variety of other things. So, sexual violence is uh, one of the major problems we all uh, see around us. Therefore, we, we need to take care of, we need to, um, you know, grow our awareness of this particular menace. Uh, when it comes to uh, rape and PTSD, rape survivors, uh, rape victims, in fact, pass through all those stages of PTSD that the non-rape uh, victims experience. Uh, so, it can be intrusion, that means uh, rape uh, victims can relive the same disturbing event uh, through flashbacks, nightmares, even distressing memories. Um, there may be objects, there may be uh, ideas, there may be people, there may be things that will constantly remind these rape survivors of the uh, distressing memories or the traumatic experience. Then that will lead to avoidance. They will begin to withdraw from uh, everyday life and this withdrawal might result in a withdrawal from oneself. That will be a very, very serious challenge. And then arousal and reactivity on the edge uh, syndrome will always be in a state of uh, fear because the cortisol level will always be very, very high. The startle experience irritation, anger, aggression, and then finally, cognition and mood will also be severely affected by this particular experience. So, that will lead to negative thoughts, self-blame, self-hatred, uh, guilt, shame, and a variety of other things. And uh, problem in concentrating, problem in decision making, or uh, losing interest in all activities uh, in life will be the same. So, uh, when we look at uh, uh, the symptoms that are reported by rape survivors and those uh, uh, for the PTSD victims, uh, there is a whole lot of similarities between these two. But apart from these similarities, there are other factors as well that are very, very specific to the rape survivors. And that is uh, called RTS or rape trauma syndrome, a very different kind of uh, trauma syndrome, which is slightly different from the traditional or the regular PTSD syndromes. And then this particular kind of syndrome leads to CPTSD, that is complex PTSD, and even severe uh, form of PTSD or extended form of PTSD. So, in the uh, rape uh, trauma stage or syndrome, 
uh, the victims will pass through different stages. The first of which is the acute stage. Acute stage will uh, show expressed, controlled and shock expressions, approaches. For example, uh, expressed uh, approaches, the person will begin to cry, so um, you know, uh, yell, scream that this has happened to me, why me only, was I the chosen one and a variety of other things and this will be very, very expressive, extremely expressive. Then the second uh, stage may be controlled uh, one. The second type of expression in this acute stage may be a controlled one. Uh, one will begin to show as if nothing has happened. One will try to hide uh, those uh, emotional disturbances or distressing emotions from others uh, owing to a variety of things, uh, public shaming or losing one's integrity in the public and so on. So it will be controlled. One will show as if nothing has happened and one will uh, show as if one uh, is normal and uh, everything is normal in his, I mean, her life. And then it can also be an expression of shock and disbelief. I can't believe this. I can't believe my friend, my partner can do this to me. So there's, there's a sense of disbelief. And then we come to the underground stage in which thoughts are blocked. Avoidance is a very, very uh, important uh, uh, negative coping strategy in this stage. Avoidance, forgetting, all negative coping strategies are in fact used during this stage. And then we come to the reorganization stage. This is a stage where uh, the, the victim uh, tries to return to uh, life through re-experiencing of all those traumatic experiences, re-experiencing of the traumatic event. So, uh, so that uh, one is uh, able to put aside the impact of the traumatic experiences uh, forever or in a convincing manner. Forgetting will help you escape the, the uh, disturbing uh, effects of the traumatic experience for a short period. But reorganization will help you put aside and move on in life. So that's very, very important. And then the finally, uh, the development and renormalization stage in which the victim begins to build or rebuild trust and gains power and control over one's body, one's mind and feels independent. And the victim also begins to discover the significant others. If you remember, I told you that the victim will lose trust. So regaining that trust in significant others is this particular stage. If a, a victim passes through all these stages, the victim will be able to overcome uh, RTS and uh, one can always return to life and begin to uh, re-experience those uh, a wide range of emotions again. So uh, this is based on uh, the RTS research done by uh, Anne Burgess and Linda Harmstrom. So it's very popul popular uh, research. So CPTSD has certain differences from PTSD. Uh, for example, it's all about dysregulation in three psychobiological areas, emotion processing, self-organization and then relational security. All these things will be dysregulated or severely affected and that will lead to difficulty uh, controlling emotions, negative self-view, you'll begin to blame yourself and uh, difficulty with relationships because the person will not be able to trust anyone anymore and then feeling as if you are permanently damaged or you have become worthless. You will develop uh, self-hatred, self-pity and then uh, loss of a system of meanings. 
your belief, your value system, all will go forever. And then the person might also feel that nobody can understand what happened to you because nobody oh, will come to you with an open mindset and try to understand what happened to you and will reaffirm that it did not happen because of you. It happened because of somebody else. So that's the kind of feeling uh, which will lead to this complex PTSD. So that way we come to uh, that night that changed everything by Elizabeth Murphy. So you can see uh, a few bright things in the beginning. That's exactly uh, what the, the victim was uh, feeling like in the beginning just before that particular um, traumatic event or uh, you know, that disturbing event happened or that terrible event happened. So she was uh, perfectly fine. She was feeling extremely elated in a good mood. She was uh, at peace with herself and suddenly something happened and then that particular something changed her life forever. So this, this is uh, how we get introduced to the idea of this particular kind of partner rape or date rape uh, in which uh, the partner in fact ends up raping the female partner and uh, thus severely denting the psychological setup. Oh, and then uh, the, the victim begins to uh, vividly depict the uh, events that led to that particular terrible event in fact. The experiences that led to that particular terrible experience or trauma. So he was standing there looking at me not feeling sorry but looking for forgive me. Something happened that particular um, thing happened and as a result of which uh, now this victim finds herself in a state of shock and sickening feeling. So, but what had been done, but I couldn't turn back time, not for this one. Now, this is a very, very powerful statement. Now, the realization is immediate. She realizes that what has been done cannot be undone. Therefore, she cannot change that particular time. And therefore, she has to do things that will help her move ahead or move on in life instead of getting stuck at this particular moment. So that's the kind of realization which uh, in fact uh, makes the victim here stronger, although she is uh, shocked and sickened in the beginning. And then the sudden realization, the acute stage is over and then she enters that particular realization stage. And then we come to how she felt. Now, what's uh, uh, interesting and important here is how vividly uh, she has depicted each and every experience of hers. Most uh, uh, people say that trauma victims generally forget a large part of the trauma experience. And when they begin to recall the trauma experiences or the trauma event, they tend to forget a large part of it. But in this case, the speaker remembers almost everything that happened and how she responded or reacted to that particular happening, that particular terrible event. So tear ran down, that's very normal because you're in a state of shock, disbelief. And then I was left there sobbing away, you know, these expressive stages in which a person sobs, cries, wails, and then body shame, um, you know, self-hatred. I felt like dirt, like I wanted to die. So the, the uh, suicidal thoughts also visit the victim's mind. I couldn't escape from this evil guy. And then uh, we come to 
In the morning, I found a note. It said, sorry, but I love you. It seemed like a sick joke. And then the victim does something very, very important. I put the note in the fire and made sure I burnt it. So this burning uh, is uh, uh, the burning of that letter, that note is in fact a very important coping uh, strategy that the speaker adopts here. Burning means you are removing the trace of that particular thing forever. She does that. And then we come to the last segment of this poetic composition, which says that a few years have gone by and here I am. That night is in my mind, but I still stand. It clearly suggests that it's very, very difficult for a trauma victim or a rape survivor to forget the traumatic experiences completely. It will continue to uh, return to you. But what's important is whether it returns to haunt you, disturb you, or you are in a place, in a position to subside its, its disturbing uh, power. That's exactly what the speaker here does. But I still stand. I have not fallen. I still stand. And then the final uh, statements, statements of affirmation. I feel so much stronger than I have ever before. I'm putting the night behind me so I can open a new door. So it's so a future oriented uh, depiction, affirmation, in which the speaker in fact says that yes, that had happened to me, but I'm in a position to overcome, I'm in a position to put that behind and I can open the new door right in front of me and I can enter a new life. So there is acceptance, there is re-experiencing the, the, the speaker, the rape survivor in this poetic composition tries to re-experience all those things. So this re-experiencing helps her come to terms with that particular terrible event or traumatic experience. So that takes us to the various coping strategies employed by or skills employed by the speaker in this poem. Reorganization is a very, very important coping skill that the speaker employs in this particular poetic composition because uh, in the reorganization stage, you return, you allow yourself to re-experience all those disturbing emotions. She does that. She is recounting her traumatic story, traumatic uh, experience and she does that successfully and she doesn't leave out any of those experiences. How she felt, what happened to her and then what the perpetrator of that violence did and then how she responded, every bit of it. So the story is very, very complete. So she is not afraid of re-experiencing all those disturbing emotions yet again. So that's the power of reorganization. And then she goes for mental recalibration. You all know calibration is all about making little changes so that a device or system can work better. We do so with our smartphones periodically. We calibrate our smartphones or recalibrate them so that we, they, they continue to work well or better for us. So that's exactly how we can also do to our mindsets. So the speaker or the rape survivor here does that. She goes for some mental recalibration. For example, uh, I cannot change what has happened. The only thing that I can change is I'll stop that particular feeling or experience continue to disturb me. I can do something to do that. I cannot change what has happened. So that is a kind of recalibration. And then towards the end, I have uh, decided to open a new door. Therefore, I feel stronger because my, my uh, system is again working well because I have gone for mental recalibration. So periodically, we can also go for mental recalibration so that we make this mental system work better. And then time reorientation is a wonderful uh, coping skill that the speaker employs here. That means instead of uh, returning to the past time and again, she is a forward looking person. She prefers to look at the future. So she is future oriented rather than past oriented. So she um, lives in the present, 
I stand here and then she focuses on the future a new door will be opened. So, time orientation skill is a very very important skill that will promptly uh, help you focus on the future and this is a skill that most athletes and uh, surgeons uh, uh, even space scientists uh, practice uh, because they have to focus a lot on the future. Uh, they can visualize the future so that they, they uh, are not uh, haunted by the past anymore. So, grounding is again a very important uh, coping skill that uh, the speaker uses here. She keeps herself grounded. Therefore, she is not dissociated from herself. She does not experience depersonalization or derealization. So, she keeps herself grounded. So, that means uh, she knows her present. She is not lost in the past. She knows the present very, very well and on the basis of her present conditions, she knows what to do in the future. So, she is thoroughly grounded. Once a person is not grounded, well, one will be lost in the past. And then integration is a very, very important uh, skill that she uses here. She tries to integrate uh, several things. She tries to uh, integrate her thoughts, positive thoughts, positive visualizations, positive actions because she acts well and that is how she achieves integration in this. And then finally, she has been able to do all those things because she practices a very important coping skill that is unstucking. She does not allow her to be stuck in one particular point in time. That means, she does not allow her to be stuck in that particular moment. That is the terrible event, the rape. She does not allow her to be stuck there all the while. She returns to that particular point just to relieve herself, to re-experience and then renormalize to relieve herself of that particular burden. Now, she is back. So, she is not stuck. So, unstucking is a very, very important skill that we all can use. Just imagine if you allow your, your mind to be stuck at one particular point, especially a negative one. Now, how um, uh, adversely that is going to affect you? All we have to do is to release. It is almost like you know freezing and releasing. So, we will have to release so that we can uh, take ourselves away from that particular point. So, that is how we come to the end of this lecture. Uh, I hope this has helped you understand uh, a set of new coping skills uh, which we, we discovered with the help of uh, the night that changed everything. Uh, so, when we meet next, uh, I will be talking about a new module. So, thank you for joining me.